writing is hard. How do I teach writing to K to three students? The research, what are the nuggets we need to know? Basically, we need to ask ourselves, what do we think would have to be automatic in order for working memory to work optimally? Well, if we look, there really is no one research that accounts for every single child that we will have in our classroom. We also know that research is always changing. However, we need to be aware of what are those key things that are gonna um, help us understand how children write. We also need to always be learning because every year we're gonna have different students in our classroom. And the thing we need to understand is that it's the teacher, not programs that help those strategies and ideas within programs work for our students. We are the ones that are responsible and can be the ones that create great writers. But with some things that all research says is that the teacher needs to be very intentional in teaching. We have to know what are those things that are gonna work for those students that are sitting in front of you. We have to know that if students are active, they are going to be keeping in um, some of the new concepts or some of those understandings tight and they will be able to make some transfers with that. Embedding the gradual release of responsibility is one of those ways that we can ensure that our active or that our participants are active. Daily writing is a must. Explicit instruction is a must. We have to be explicit in those pieces of writing that we're teaching our students. Understanding that writing is complex helps us to approach it in a way that we then can break it down for our students. And understanding that writing is developmental is also key. How small children can think of an idea that is acceptable to them and then manage to get it on paper is a very complex process and involves a number of cognitive processes. These processes involve attention, focus, cognitive memory, and the mechanics to transcribe. Writers, as we probably know from firsthand, have to juggle ideas, content, language norms, such as spelling and grammar. They need to juggle the ideas and those suggestions, such as genre, the, who the reader is, our motor skills, like holding the pen or navigating the keyboard, while at the same time, writing text. So for a small child in kindergarten, grade one, two, or three, sometimes just coming up with an idea can be complex. The idea of being able to get that down on paper, uh, being familiar with language norms, spelling, letter formation, uh, maybe fine motor skills aren't that great. What order do I put these words in? Conventions, the reader, who's going to be reading my paper? Or wait a minute, after I write this down, I got to read this or someone has to read it. Now, doing all of those things at the same time can be very complex for children who maybe have never really written before. When we look closer at some of the skills in composing and transcribing, um, we are really thinking about how there are two things that help our students be fluent writers. And that is being able to have all those skills involved in transcribing and all those skills involved in actually coming up with something and composing. So for example, if you've noticed you have a child in the class who has very fine motor, very poor fine motor skills, you may not notice, but maybe you will now after you know thinking about this, is that all their effort and energy is being placed on how do I hold my pencil or how to form those letters rather than being able to hold their idea in their head while trying to get this down on paper. Also, children who get hung up on spelling or not sure where to find the word or forget how to spell some of the words or um, how to form the letters within a word can sometimes become um, frustrated or they're putting, again, all their energy into that rather than being able to hold on to that idea that they had before their sentence has even begun or complete. So we want our child to be automatic. We want them to become fluent. And so we need to really work on those, especially from kindergarten to grade three, because as we know in the curriculum, there are higher expectations and higher order skills that need to be tackled. Um, some of this, there's research that's been done as well as if you happen to look at Ramsey and Benz, who are two Alberta women who um, have done a lot of professional development, um, they speak as well to the transcribing and composing skills that are necessary for students. And Miriam Ramsey, um, one of the gals in Ramsey and Benz, her PhD was involved in writing in grade one. 
So I'm going to just sort of like take us on a little bit of a slight detour here and talk about a structure or a routine that would really help us enabling students or helping us to plan for our students when it comes to those things that they need for their developmental success in writing. And embedding um, what is important into a routine is sometimes what helps us do that. So why routines? So before we get into the strategies and how we can teach writing and resolve some of the difficulties that students may have, let's kind of look at some examples of a routine that maybe we can embed into our planning that will help us um, plan those pieces that are so important. A routine is something that you can put in place, have in place daily, and then just plug in all those things that are going to help us address the curriculum as well as meet the needs of our students. It's like it's kind of like a framework. Here's an example of a writing block routine. And you'll notice that each day something different is occurring, but you'll also notice that within this routine, the students are writing every day. Uh, there's addressing of needs where we're doing the gradual of release, especially in the different um, strategies that are being used. And there's time built into the routine for explicit instruction. So you'll notice that on Monday is journal time. And you'll see on the right hand side where there are pieces of the curriculum that maybe journaling or the modeling of ideas are addressed. You'll see on Tuesday, we're now looking at shared writing which again involves a lot of modeling and addresses curriculum outcomes in K to, K to grade three. Wednesday is where we're looking at a mini lesson where here we're having explicit instruction on how to write great sentences or story writing, or maybe we're looking at how to edit. And again, the curricular outcomes on the right-hand side. Thursday might be a day where it's another mini lesson that might build on what was done on Wednesday, but it's also giving time then to look at how students may continue what they've learned, or maybe we are building on what we've learned the day before. And Friday is one of those more freer days where we are finishing up maybe some of the, the lessons and some of the skills and some of the writing pieces that we have been working on. But every day, there's an opportunity for students to be writing. There's an opportunity to look at different forms of writing. There are uh, plenty of opportunity to model what writing looks like and how we can actually help, to help students to see what writing looks like when we are writing. Wednesday is where we are really explicit in our lessons. And then Thursday and Friday are times for the students to continue practicing what they have learned. Um, kindergarten might be look a little slightly different. So our slide on right here could be totally for grades one to three. And kindergarten might look different depending if you have kindergarten with the students every day or if it's a 20 minute writing block on every other day. But basically, same kind of idea where we're looking at what are we going to do on day one? How are we how are we having the students um, writing? How are we modeling what writing looks like? Maybe we need to embed some small group instruction to help those students that are struggling. Um, and then day two is a shared writing experience, again, with more modeling, where we are looking at sharing the pen, we're having students practice, and what's built in as well is that printing practice piece. Another example of routine, this one is taken from Adrienne Gear. Um, Monday, she um, kind of inspires the students with an anchor book, which might be a read aloud. And again, where during that time or after that time, of reading, there's some modeling of planning or just modeling what planning looks like. Tuesday and Wednesday might be where then the students are getting their, their own model of planning or their planning down and sharing with a partner. There might be a mini lesson on a writing technique, again, more modeling of writing and time for students to write themselves. Thursday, revising, we're looking at what we've already written from the days before, we're maybe revising, we're editing, and teacher may be going around and having little conferences with students. Another routine, and this is taken from two writing teachers online, they start off by having a lesson, um, and basically their lessons are very similar. So their mini lesson and modeling happens in 10 minutes, where again, like Adrian Gear, they might involve um, reading a text to the students where maybe they're demonstrating to students, modeling and teaching students our tool in writing. Then um, following that 10 minutes is 50 minutes of talking, drawing, writing, 
um, where they're talking about what they're writing, they're drawing, they're maybe then moving into the writing after they draw out their plan or actually draw maybe some ideas, which is a really good idea developmentally. And then sharing five to 10 minutes of where we're talking about our writing. Maybe it's in partners, maybe it's with the class. Um, again, a really good idea to kind of talk with each other about writing. So what is it exactly that we need to be teaching when it comes to writing? In Alberta, we have a curriculum. And so what does that look like? So now that we know, you know, how students may be struggling a little bit, and we understand that writing is developmental, um, and we've kind of considered having a routine in our planning, what then are some of those non-negotiables? Well, we, the curriculum, the learning outcomes are non-negotiable. And um, Alberta education has been very, very clear that it's the learning outcome that we have to ensure that uh, students have mastered by the end of the year. In the English language arts and literature curriculum in Alberta, the learning outcome for kindergarten, there's only actually one in the writing set, in the organizing idea of writing. Um, children experiment with written expression of ideas and information, and then I've summarized basically that it's through creative writing, the beginning research process, and ways that they can share their writing are the three sort of big areas that we would build our lessons upon and ensure that our students have had that opportunity to experiment with written ex expression of ideas and information. In grade one, the learning outcome is that students create. Here we're now not only ex experimenting, but we're building on that and we're creating messages through the writing process. So we are teaching the students about the writing process. We are um, teaching them about what creative writing is. We are taking them through those beginning research process, how we look up factual information. And then we are also looking at digital and um, non-digital ways of writing, printing and keyboarding. Grade two is a build on that, where now in the learning outcome, students create and enhance ideas and information by applying a variety of writing process, uh, processes. So again, we're looking at writing what the writing process is and taking the students through that. Again, creative writing, research process, and different methods of writing. And in grade three, again, building on that previous learning outcome, students are investigate, investigate writing and the research processes that support informed written expression. So a little more complex, but again, we're really looking at that writing process and building upon those skills. We are taking them through much um, more, um, uh, more uh, uh, creative ways of writing, organizing, word choice, sensory details. We are taking students through the writing process Again, questioning, making sure that we're citing our sources and methods. So we're looking not only at printing and keyboarding cursive uh, and cursive, but we're also looking at letter formation, size, proportion, slant, and basic keyboarding and keystroking skills. So we have to make sure that we are addressing those. We're keeping in mind how students are developmentally um, in the process of becoming writers and we have a routine. So now let's look, how do we do this? How do we do this within our writing routine? So if I decide that my routine is gonna look something like this, I'm going to make sure, especially in K-3, that I've got time somewhere in there for printing practice. And in grade three, we're gonna be doing some cursive. So we're gonna be looking here at what our mini lesson um, might be looking at. And this is where I'm really gonna consider what my outcome and the cusps are for my lesson and which ones I'm going to address. So this might be explicit lesson. I'm gonna have writing time for the students where again, I'm building that, sus that sustained time and building stamina for my students to write independently we are going to, again, be basing the writing time based on whatever that explicit writing or mini lesson was about. We want to have a time in there where I am giving them feedback or they are sharing with a partner and maybe getting more ideas or revising and editing together and perhaps some class sharing time. So this could be like what your mini um, routine might look like. I might have printing practice maybe at the beginning of that, or I might decide that my printing practice might be at the end. I mean, again, it's totally up to your, up to you and to who your students are. All right, so that's how we can kind of in a routine build in some of those things. But now let's look at some explicit strategies that we might want to uh, make sure that we are embedding so that our students are becoming more fluent and automatic in their writing.
All right. So as mentioned before, that building that foundation of key skills is vital, especially in kindergarten and grade one. In order for automaticity to occur, we need to make sure that their fine motor skills are strong, that we're building that foundation, that we are helping them engaging their ability to hold a pencil, that they've got the right tools, and that this soon does not become a chore and doesn't end up being where all of their focus and energy is being focused on. So we also want to make sure that we are embedding our printing practice, where again, they are uh, grasping the pencil in a way that is optimal for their letter formation. They know how to um, form letters and they've got that concept of the crossbody movement so that they can start on the left-hand side of the paper and move slowly across. So some activities just, you know, in general that you can use in your classroom to build some of those fine motor skills, finger plays, playing with um, uh, Play-Doh, um, rolling Play-Doh between fingers, making snakes, pinch grip, light bright um, is a really good activity where the students have to use their fine motor and their pincer grasp in order to um, place the little um, colored um, piece into the, the light bright board using chopsticks, sorting pom-poms. Matman, um, if you Google Matman, you'll find that there are all kinds of different little activities that you can do where, again, this helps students have pay attention to detail and placement of different parts. It also assists with visual discrimination and reversals. And you don't want to forget those uh, explicit printing instruction where the students are practicing these letters. And some it doesn't always have to be on paper and using pencil. Some students may have um, an aversion or struggle with the the um, how a little bit rough or harder it is to perhaps move a pencil over a uh, paper where you might want to start start with little small whiteboards and students are practicing that way where there's um, less friction. Um, but as well, um, you know, there are different things that you might want to also have students do practicing letters in the air on their desks. Um, maybe practicing with whiteboard markers on windows. And again, just having those students use uh, big mo movements in forming those letters. Just a few fun facts on the slide that um, I am learning all the time, um, but again, some of you may have not realized that if students are not automatic with their printing, keyboarding may also result in uh, just sort of a hunk, hunt and peck type activity. So kids with great printing tend to be better keyboarders. And um, printing will also set up kids for success, not only in keyboarding, but also in cursive writing. So we, we're building up those fine motor skills, and now we need to look at the student's uh, automaticity in um, having being able to spell certain words, especially those high-frequency words, which we find a lot in text. So if students aren't fluent with the spelling words that they need, this too will hold them back, right? So our high-frequency words are critical for releasing some of that memory space. So again, without getting into phonics and morphology, just some activities that students um, will um, benefit from is just working on those high frequency words. Fry's first 300 words, the first 25 words show up in 33% of the text out there. The first 150% of the text, the first 300 is found in the 66% of our text out there. So we want them to have a good chunk and a good um, repertoire of high frequency words, especially like words in kindergarten, um, they can by the end of the year learn um, how to spell the or is or some of those meaningful words like mom, dad, dog, cat. Um, so being able to uh, have some of those words in their little bank is going to help them be much more fluent in their writing once they're, we've got their fine motor built up. And again, having and knowing those 300 words is going to release some of those, that working memory, so that they can focus more on that automaticity. See, say, spell is, again, one of those activities you can do with kids where they see a word, they say the word, and then they spell the word. And then maybe the next step might be writing the word or spelling the word with magnetic letters. Um, we want to connect visual discrimination with sound discrimination so that they can make those connections with the letters, and that, that's beginning phonics. And then we want to consolidate some of those high frequency words by sight, sight word tap, sight word bingo, sight word sorts. And again, make break if you can, write and read. And those again are, you know, you make the word um, if it's a compound word or a, if you're looking at morphology, if can you break the word into um, 
prefix and base word. Um, then we write the word and then we read the word again. Um, and if you're familiar with Adrian Gear, if you're familiar with Miriam Treehern, they are um, provide those no excuse word lists again, which are a great guide to use. Um, as well, if you go to um, Alberta Education to the curriculum website and and go to the resources link and search for uh, word lists. Uh, you will get recommended word lists as well for students to have under their belt. Um, kindergarten will give example of like 10 to 20 words that they might want to have by the end of kindergarten all the way up to grade three, no excuse words. Again, some best practices in word study. There are so many programs out there and any effective program should follow sort of an alphabet level, pattern level, morphine letter level progression of word um, work. And so again, there are different ways of tackling that, but you have to also understand what level your students are at. So we ha might have word cards where we just have little um, recipe cards that will have words on them. We want the kids to see, to say, to spell, to sort those words. Um, we can use magnetic letters where they're saying the words, they're making the words, they're breaking, they're writing the words. And again, really helping students differentiate between letters and sounds and the visual that are very similar in nature, as well as looking and teaching students those pattern levels where it might sound the same, but is spelt differently. Um, and as well as those morpheme um, uh, uh, levels where we're looking at root or base words, we're looking at prefixes and suffixes. And all of that will help our students become much more fluent in their um, spelling. Some more best practices where we're thinking aloud how to spell certain words. Again, I used to do a lot of modeling with students and teachers who do have students now who are able to see what is going on in someone's head while they're writing. So if we can model um, where we can look, if it's on the word wall, if it's in a little personal dictionary, if it's over on the bulletin board somewhere because we labeled a, a science diagram or whatever, that's going to help and remind students where to look for a word. Um, there's tons of word sorts out there where we might have words, uh, students practicing, um, uh, again, different uh, uh, ways of sorting words, whether it's short A and CVC, or it's uh, long A, CVC with E, or again, there's so many different patterns out there that we can have students sort. Um, transferring word study then into actual writing sentences. So once students get really good at working with different words and learning about their parts and their sounds, now let's dictate sentences. Let's have students write uh, sentences with those words. And the morning message is one of those great ways that every day there could be a message on the word, perhaps using words that students already know, where they're given that practice to read um, what they already know, so that when it comes to writing, um, those are going to come a much quicker for them. If we go into, again, and this is just an example of what I referred to before, if we go to New, New Learn Alberta to the resources tab, um, we are going to find, um, and we can search where those are just word lists and up will come 300 high frequency words for second grade, third grade. Here are the first 10 high frequency words for kindergarten. So this is what it's gonna look like if you're searching within the resources, what you are wanting to get examples of that you can use with the students. Now, we're, we've kind of looked at some of the mechanics. We've looked at um, how we need to consider the developmental process of writing, how students need to be automatic, how they need to become fluent in transcribing and composing. But maybe now we should look at how can we help students um, generate ideas or reasons to write. And so, of course, there are so many wonderful books out there that can really help us help students um, think of things and purposes and read and reasons to write. And so here's just some example of, of some books that would be really um, great to read to students if perhaps there's a topic or this might even help them with generating a topic about, or perhaps writing about themselves or somebody like them. So these are, again, just some examples all about me that, um, you know, students can get ideas on what to tell about themselves if they are writing. This one, um, again, is all about friends. Maybe we're writing about friends now. And so here are some books that are going to talk about 
um, how maybe friends interact, um, how to behave with a friend, how we um, interact with a friend, some ideas there. Um, maybe we're going to have the students write all about their name. Um, here are some examples of books that are all about names. So once we've done that, one of the, um, again, you know, we want students to also understand writing structures. So we've got our transcribing and our composing underway. We've talked about different ideas. And so we want students now to begin. And again, this, this starts to come up, especially in grade two and three, where we are looking at um, personal narratives or nonfiction writing or story writing or even poetry. And all of these are listed in our curriculum. This here is just an example of a very old resource that um, Pearson used to put out, the Writing Map of Development. And, um, and it's it's still floating around out there. It's a really useful um, uh, graphic to keep in a plan book because within this, it talks about what are those things that we need to have in order to be, to be a writer. We have to understand these queuing systems, which involve um, sentence or word order, um, it's that understanding of graphemes and uh, this is the spelling and the connection between sound and letters as well as meaning. And, um, and then the next layer is all about different writing strategies that we can embed in our planning. Um, and again, our writing processes, which are clearly articulated in our curriculum as well as a different range of text forms, which is very helpful because along with the curriculum and in with helping our students understand the different writing strategies and the processes out there, we can have multiple ways of, uh, or multiple forms of writing that are gonna help students with those pieces of um, the process, writing process and creative writing and research which are all articulated in the curriculum. So again, um, just an example that of, um, you know, the writing processes in sort of like a little key um, bookmark or a little bookmark that's within the writing folder where we are constantly referring to the writing process because that is key in helping students become better writers. And so we always will have the planning process where we're brainstorming, gathering ideas, we're choosing topics and we're picking the best one. We are creating some form of a draft or an outline where we begin planning our story. We get the students to begin writing. We're revising, going back. Does it make sense? Are the sentences in the right order? Um, now we're checking for um, spelling, punctuation, grammar, our editing, and then perhaps sharing. And again, all of these pieces to the writing processes are clearly articulated throughout the curriculum. In kindergarten, we're experimenting. In grade one and two, we're planning, writing, editing, sharing. And in grade three, we're planning, drafting, revising, editing, and sharing. So, um, and now let's look at a few of those um, strategies we might wanna use with the students while we are teaching the, pro the writing processes. So journal writing, K to three. Um, again, this is really good place for teachers to model what writing looks like and sounds like when you're modeling out loud how to write something. Um, you might wanna model and think aloud how we will start with a capital at the beginning. We're leaving spaces between the words. Um, this is the sentence I'm going to write. Um, here's where I'm going to look to find that word that I can't remember how to spell, right? So again, the journal is sort of like a um, um, probably more of a free way of having students write whatever they want. And maybe the emphasis is a little less on the perfection and we are focusing more on the flow. They're writing news about themselves or writing what they wish they could do or writing about whatever they want. Shared writing, this is a strategy that is so, um, uh, I find that this is a very, a very um, classic um, activity for students because again, it's where the students are working with you to come up with a sentence or students again, here an example might be where it might be all about the news and it, every week, five students tell their news and the teacher and that student in front of the rest of the class think through what the, what is the sentence going to be? What do I put at the beginning of the sentence? Um, how do I spell this word? Um, do I leave space? I leave spaces between my words. What do I put at the end? And so the teacher might repeat or say the news in a sentence, modeling what the sentence will be that they're going to actually write. 
And so you'll see on the slide here that if we use the example, John got a new red bike on Saturday, the teacher would repeat it and ask John if that sounds okay to write in the news book, and then slowly repeat and repeat, repeat the word. John might come up and write his own name in the news. John might already know that we need to leave a space, so he's going to write the word got in there. He knows how to leave a space, and he knows how to sound out and spell the word got. So it's a sharing and a modeling of writing. And um, an example of this might be where you create this news book, and that, that all those sentences every week. Um, are in that book and it becomes a dear time book or it becomes a book that the kids can refer to um, because they remembered that the word red was in there and they can go back and look at it the next time they're doing their own independent writing. Guided writing, again, so important. There are some children ju that just need more guiding than others. And this gives you an opportunity as well to embed this within your routine and help you help the students or have help you to find that time regularly to work with one student or a small group of students. And maybe it is just leaving spaces between words. Maybe it is about being consistent and capitalizing. Maybe with the higher kids, it's about, you know, reordering sentences so that it makes sense. And we're going through on how to revise. Conferencing is also something too, where many teachers, what they do while the students are writing independently, go around and talk to the students about their writing. So while the students are journal writing or practicing something from a mini lesson, the teacher goes around and listens to them as they maybe are talking out loud with uh, about their writing to the teacher um, and things you can ask students like, oh, I noticed that you're leaving excellent spaces between your words. So um, what do we put at the end of a sentence and just talking about the whole mechanics of writing um, and the pro writing process and gives you an opportunity to just get that little more information about the students as they are actually writing. In the early grades, um, there's nothing like labeling and pattern sentences, right? In kindergarten, um, students can draw pictures and as they become more familiar with words, they might wanna start labeling um, their pictures and from there can go on to maybe using pattern sentences. But again, I wanna to stress too that we don't want kids to get locked into using pattern sentences and we want to encourage them quickly to move away from pattern sentences and come up with some of their own ideas because you'll have some students that become very dependent on pattern sentences and perhaps the writing becomes only about the pattern sentence. I like, I like, I like. And I'm sure many of you who have experience with teaching students how to write will have noticed that there's the, that odd once, you know, that every odd student might have a page where it's like, I like mom, I like dad, I like my cat, right? Which is fine in the beginning, but we want them to quickly move out of that. Similarly, how we want kids to quickly move out of decodable reading, we want students to become, become, become quickly moving out of those pattern sentences so they can start being a little more fluent in other types. Super sentences, I've seen so many resources out there where, um, again, the idea behind this is taking a very simple sentence and then brainstorming with the whole class or with a small group or even one-on-one -on -one with students about how we can embed some very, you know, adjectives and adverbs into a sentence to make it way more interesting or to make it a super sentence. So here's an example of the rabbit hopped, the, well, what kind of rabbit? So we brainstorm some maybe color words, rabbit, and then instead of hopped, are there other words that we can think of that might be similar to the word hopped? And then where maybe the, the uh, rabbit might have hopped. And then the students can rewrite the sentence choosing their own words and write a super sentence. I've also seen um, where you can set up a classroom center where after the kids have been taught this, they've actually been doing some writing on their own. And then you've got word cards where in a center, the kids can do the same thing using word cards and then writing out their super sentence on a sentence strip. Story writing, this, um, I've seen some um, um, of this being tackled in grade one. Um, sometimes we need to help students then understand, you know, the idea, and this is in the curriculum, teaching beginning, middle, and ending to stories. Mentor texts are great for supporting that, where we talk then about what the beginning, what happened in the beginning, what happened in the middle, what happened at the end. Fairy tales are also a great way of doing that because students um, if they've been read fairy tales, we'll um, remember them. Um, we can use graphic organizers. And, you know, we talk about what happened in, the, we draw a picture maybe starting initially. This might work better for some students to draw the picture of what happened in the, at the beginning, in the middle, and the end, and then they write sentences to go with their pictures. Um, 
lots of different ways to get students writing um, with mailboxes. Um, uh, Miriam Treehern um, worked with a classroom um, where there was a huge stuffed um, dog in the classroom and the kids would write to Wags the dog. Mailboxes, kids love to write letters um, to the principal or to their friend next door or whatever, and those can be um, mailed in the mailbox, um, delivered after hours by the teacher, and then perhaps when the flag is up the next day, they've got some responses from somebody they wrote to. I love this idea as well, where um, and again, um, I believe um, Adrian Gear has also an idea similar to this. I've taken this from um, Laurie Jameson Rog, where you um, the kids you might have a time during a writing block where kids are thinking up ideas, and to keep track of some of those ideas they might later want to write about, they will write them on centum strips and place it in a pocket in their writing notebook, or perhaps it's on a page that's divided and they are drawing you know, a picture, a little sketch with perhaps a few words labeling what their idea is. Maybe you have some dedicated pages in a journal where they will write down ideas. Again, that helps with not being able to, you know, some students just can't think of an idea. Um, also the, um, and again, this is modified for Lori, from Lori Jamison Rog, writing ideas um, and choice card where again, maybe this is an example of what's in their writing booklet or the writing journal where um, this is glued in and the kids will write down some ideas. And then on days where they're writing whatever they want to write about, um, they can pick one of these ideas. Um, storm and sort where we're organizing ideas. Uh, perhaps you've taken the kids on a field trip and you start off by brainstorming all the events or an, uh, that happened during the activity. You write each event on a strip of paper. Um, late the next day, you might photocopy it. The students will sort and you will then have the students can then sort those, I should say, those ideas. And then they can write about it in more detail in their notebook or as a group. Um, again, engagement motivation is really important, whether it's reading or writing, sometimes just having a cool or neat or tiny little writing center. Um, if you've ever read Chrysanthemum, or I should say, I think it's Lily's Purple Plastic Purse um, by David or Kevin Hankies. Um, in that book, there's the light bulb center where kids can go and draw and write and color. And so if you've got a place for them to go where they get to use those smelly markers, or those different types of crayons and pencils and erasers and scissors and really cool writing paper and all of those kinds of things. Sometimes that's all it might take for them to be really motivated to write something. Um, so I've seen some cl classes where they actually have a whole wall that's just covered in paper of some sort and the kids can write down kind, and again, that might have to be a whole lesson on um, what a kind message <laughs> looks like, but you know, thoughts and ideas and kind messages um, written on the, maybe on a board that's right there in the writing center. Um, one resource I'd really like to highlight is Pobble 365. You can Google that and um, they, uh, it's, I find this a very inspirational um, place to go to find ideas. Um, and basically the way it is um, uh, pulled together is that in the calendar, there will be a picture every day that you can show the students. And then within that um, uh, resource, they also have ways or suggestions that you can use to get students to maybe write about that picture. Um, here's an example of, you know, the picture for a day in the fall. And um, this would be an example of what you could do with the students. And I, it's cut off, but it says falling. They also provide word words that you can um, have students have access to, or you can print off for the students so that they can choose words to write about that picture. And again, so many ideas ideas that I couldn't possibly squeeze them all in on this slide. All right, so let's recap some of those really important things we need to take away from this uh, presentation. Um, students need to write every day. There's so much research on that. We need to ensure that we can help students build their foundational skills so that we don't have energy being um, exerted into just holding a pencil or forming letters or trying to think up words. We want them to become fluent writers. Let's provide structures and frameworks so that when we're teaching, we're ensuring that we're teaching the curriculum and we're giving them time to write every day and that we have time to teach them all those important and explicit skills. 
We want to embed everything we do into our routine so that we can do that. And that's that structure and that framework. We want to give students the tools they need to be successful. Let's give them those strategies. Let's give them those, those opportunities to come up with ideas. And anytime they do have an idea, somewhere to write them down so that they can come back to it. We want to make sure that we're engaging the students in things that they're going to get excited about. And we want to help students to want to write every day. Just a few resources that were mentioned throughout this presentation. Again, Benson Ramsey, check out layersofliteracy.com. Lots of resources there. Um, the graphic that I showed you um, came from the first steps in writing. I'm not sure you will find that anymore, that, that uh, graphic on um, the different um, things we need to know in order to plan our writing, but you can give it a shot. Um, writing Power by Adrian Gear, Powerful Writing Structures by Adrian Gear. Also, uh, Stephen Graham is the one I've referred to um, by telling you how we have to have students writing every single day. He is very big on that. Uh, Lori Jameson Rogg, um, again, some of those ideas that I've shared with you comes from her marvelous mini lessons for teaching beginning writing K-3. to Pobble.com is that very inspirational website that you can, um, and the membership is not expensive, as well as uh, Miriam Treherne, Multiple Pathways, Paths to Literacy, K-2, to where, again, some of those ideas were taken from. I'm hoping that you were able to glean some ideas from the presentation. Re don't forget to check out the ARPDC resource site and New Learn Alberta. Um, both places, you will find lots of, of um, suggestions for planning, for routines, for resources, um, the curriculum, of course, in New Learn Alberta. And again, if you check the resources tab there, you will find, um, or you can also search within that to find those word lists I was referring to.